Early this year, DeepMind released a database of hundreds of thousands of protein structures predicted by its algor machine algorithm uh, called AlphaFold. This was seen by many as a breakthrough in protein folding, one of, this, one of science's most complex problems, and a new hope in the fight against complex diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's. To talk to us today, we have John Jumper, AlphaFold lead at DeepMind, and Ben Perry, a discovery lead at the Geneva-based Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Welcome both. Uh, John, starting with you. So DeepMind has always been more associated with beating humans at complex games like Go, rather than solving difficult biology problems. So tell us how the AlphaFold project started. I mean, AlphaFold really started, and there were, there were really two threads that got it started. I should say that DeepMind's goal has always been to develop um, AI technologies and to apply them for the benefit of the world and science. And games were an incredible test bed uh, for these ideas as they've been developed. But to really demonstrate the application to really important societal problems, it's really great to be able to go to science. And we were always thinking about how can we get into kind of scientific problems and really impact the world and health and everything else. And then there was also this bottom-up effort where individual researchers were thinking, what could we do? And, you know, I, literally in the case of this, when we started like five years ago, Googling grand challenges in biology and protein folding came up and it, it grew and it grew. And, and these very quickly came together and became this project that the organization was very excited about and that we started to do some really great work on. So, in December 2018, you had a breakthrough at the CASP competition. The CASP stands for Critical Assessment of Techniques of Protein Structure Prediction. Tell us what happened. So, uh, CASP is this really incredible uh, thing in science that every two years, the uh, entire community of researchers that work on the question of predicting a protein structure get together to see really how they do. And with the collaboration of experimentalists who submit structures that aren't currently published or otherwise known. And it really lets everyone test how they, how they do on this. And, you know, this started all the way back in 1994 and really provides this very sobering assessment of how we were doing on this problem. And, um, so we had, uh, so we had started, we had entered previously CASP two years ago and, built the system that was uh, that had delivered the best system, had one cast, but was still quite far um, away from really getting to in high scientific utility of really being something that an experimentalist who really needed to know a protein structure that they could trust the output of this tool. And so we had gone back and we had um, really gone back to the drawing board and really rethought completely how we approach this and how do we develop AI methods for this problem and put together this larger team and said, how can we do this just completely differently and rethink it? And that became um, this, uh, the system AlphaFold 2. And, as, and when we kind of developed that and deployed that in CASP, we saw this incredible performance out of the system that we, in the, uh, in the opinion of the assessors, about two thirds of the predictions that come have an accuracy competitive with experiment. It becomes very difficult to decide whether discrepancies uh, are actually the algorithm giving the wrong answer or details of the experiment that don't match exactly um, the normal structure of the protein. And so we saw this kind of really incredible thing and coming out of CASP, we, we kind of made these promises that we were both gonna write a scientific paper and then make the method broadly accessible. And we started to sit down and really say, you know, what is it? This is a very, very important thing. How do we best make this successful? And how do we get this beyond kind of the community of people that work on these extraordinarily hard problems? And how do we get it out to the wider community? And so um, we had settled in, uh, with a lot of work and developed this partnership with EBI, um, which is a great organization that manages these resources to put together the structure of all human proteins and then 20 other organisms and make them freely available to all researchers via this website. And that was uh, really an incredible undertaking to move this from, you know, kind of a, a competition assessment style tool that shows this is how you get really 
get accuracy to what are researchers going to use day to day? What can really make an impact for all the biologists who are not specialists that can reach out really to the bigger impacts of this tool? So, I mean, I guess the question is, so protein folding has been a problem, one of, known as one of the hardest problems to solve in science. So why do you think DeepMind has succeeded where others have not, historically? I think it's a really interesting question. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting question relative to a lot of even what you, hear, what you hear and think about in terms of machine learning. And machine learning is obviously data-driven and we're dependent on this incredible collection of data, the protein data bank that experimentalists have put together. But it wasn't really the growth of data that enabled this, that we've probably had the data to solve this problem for a long time. But what was really missing were some real breakthroughs in machine learning and especially how we take the ideas of machine learning and change them and make new ones specifically for proteins. And how, and I think maybe what really helped DeepMind solve this is being able to put together this interdisciplinary team. I come from kind of a protein and computation background, but we have people that came from a speech processing background or pure machine learning or physics or all these other backgrounds. And how do you bring all those people together uh, to really reconceive how you would attack this problem? And I think that we did, you know, I mean, always, you know, we got lucky at this moment in history and, you know, chose well on problems at the time. But I think there was also this aspect of bringing together an interdisciplinary team and rethinking at a very fundamental level, like not put our knowledge of proteins around the outside of a standard neural network, but how do we rebuild how we think about neural networks to understand proteins, to understand evolution? And I think that really is responsible for the enormous gains we saw. So now, uh, my next question is really about the AlphaFold protein structure database. Uh, tell me a little bit more about it and tell me about its importance to the medical community at large. So the AlphaFold Protein Structure Database is a collection right now of about of more than 350,000 protein structures that are all predicted with AlphaFold. So this covers almost all human, 98.5% of all human proteins, and then 20 more organisms like mouse and uh, E. coli and all the other important research organisms. And it's really, and it's freely available for use, commercial, non-commercial under a very uh, permissive license. And it's something where a researcher that's uh, working on a specific protein can just go immediately get the alpha fold answer. But I think it's also interesting because not just is it a place where you can get one answer, but you can get all the answers we give. And I'm really excited that it's also a place where someone who is thinking about, you know, all of human biology or trying to interpret um, DNA or anything else can get the predictions of every protein can download human human proteome.zip and get the collection of all these predictions at once. And so really excited about the possible transformative uses when we, you know, we've known uh, human DNA for a long time, but this is the first time when we have a pretty good picture of all the well-folded proteins within um, the human cell uh, at some level of accuracy and really excited about what that will mean in terms of interpreting things that involve the whole human genome or even cross comparisons to organisms. And it's something we're also um, committed and working on expanding now from about 350,000 proteins to about 100 million to really cover all the cataloged uh, proteins. And we think this will be a really, really interesting resource for all sorts of comparison and understanding of even obscure organisms and, you know, as we, as we know with um, you know, the COVID epidemic, that obscure organisms can become very important. And so we're very excited about what this will mean in terms of disease biology, um, in terms of neglected diseases, in terms of all these other things and how we relate to uh, all the proteins that we've collected thanks to the genomics revolution that has given us so much information about DNA and our techniques for understanding proteins haven't scaled nearly as well, and computational methods really just have to step up and fill that gap. Of course. Ben, I'm going to turn now to you. So you work for the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Tell us a little bit more about, about what you guys do. Yeah, sure. So, um, yes, I work for DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that look at uh, 
designing, developing new drugs for neglected tropical diseases or for neglected patients. So there are a lot of diseases that are out there that are not necessarily served particularly well by the existing um, industry-led approach to new medicines. But there is a huge need for new medicines, diseases like leishmaniasis and sleeping sickness and um, mainly other parasitic diseases. We work very much like a pharma company, uh, doing early stage research. We do development. We take all our compounds all the way through the clinic until we reach molecules that can actually get into the hands of clinicians and patients. And we've been doing this for about 16 or 17 years now, um, entirely in a non-profit space. We're very lucky because we are able to open, work quite openly. We don't necessarily have to protect any of our discoveries with patents or be particularly uh, protective of our results. And this enables us to work very closely with a whole host uh, of, of different partners across the world, be it academic groups, government organizations. We get a lot of uh, work and a lot of um, very valuable contributions coming from the pharma industry themselves. And it also allows us to work with cutting edge technologies, emerging technologies such as those coming from DeepMind, because we can be quite open about the results and the way that we're using those technologies. And tell me about the partnership. How did it come about? Yeah, sure. So we, we had some connections. Um, I work in the discovery team at DNDI, so I'm right at the very early stage of that process of designing and discovering new drugs. So I work very much as at, at, at the, the point at which we try to find the new chemical structure that can have an impact on a particular disease. Um, we had a couple of collaborators, one who had recently moved to work at DeepMind uh, and a few others that we knew that we collaborated with on other AI-led projects within um, you know, the broader Google community. And they reached out to us um, a little while after the initial uh, results from the CASP competition, so towards the end of last year, uh, asking if we had any examples of projects in our discovery space that could really benefit from an alpha fold type approach. So this is before the database was released, um, but what? But after, after the announcement had been made of this huge progress made by um, by John and the team, so we pulled together a couple of examples of projects which might uh, benefit from from this approach. Partic one 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 project in particular that that I should flag, which was this. Um, we'd, we'd found some new molecules that seemed to be very interesting in terms of the, the way that they could kill certain parasites that are of real interest to us. These are called kinetoplastid parasites. They're the causative agents of leishmaniasis, of um, sleeping sickness, and of Chagas disease. And we had some molecules that we knew were able to kill uh, the, these, these parasites uh, in a relatively efficient manner. Um, we had no idea how they were doing that. So we knew that they kill the parasite. We knew that they weren't toxic per se, but we had no idea what protein they were targeting. I mean, pretty much all drugs work through targeting a specific protein or maybe a couple of proteins. We had no idea what they were doing. And we worked closely with some academics in the UK to look at these molecules. And they said, well, we, we're pretty certain it's interfering on this particular pathway. It's working through this this, this, this part of the metabolism of the parasite. In fact, we think it's working by inhibiting this particular protein. And that was really interesting result. Um, but unfortunately, it was one of the proteins that doesn't yield to it to having its structure elucidated by classical methods, by X-ray or NMR. It was um, a really problematic protein. So we took that to the team at DeepMind and said, you know, if you can work out what the structure of this is, if you can fold the structure of that, that's really, really going to help us on our project. Because once you have a molecule and you know the way that that molecule binds to the protein through which it exists, exerts its, uh, its activity, it really helps in that design process of making the molecule better. We need to make the molecule really efficient at inhibiting that protein. And we also need to make changes that allow us to ensure the molecule is not toxic, to ensure that the molecule can be given, for example, as an oral pill. Um, so DeepMind went away, came back a couple of days later saying, we're pretty certain here's the structure. We've got quite a high confidence in the way we've predicted this. It, it look, looks really good. And, and they, they passed that, that structure over to us. Um, and we've been working on that uh, along with the university team in the UK to understand how these molecules we'd identified uh, as being active against, in this particular instance, uh, leishmaniasis or le leishmania, um, to understand how those molecules bind. And uh, we, we had a, a catch-up call on this just yesterday. We now know exactly how these molecules are binding into this protein uh, from the parasite. And really interestingly, because of the release of the database that John just mentioned, we were also, all the researchers were able to immediately access through that database, the equivalent protein in the human 
genome, from the human proteome. That's really important because if the molecule also binds to that protein, that could be problematic. You might have a molecule that, yes, it can kill the parasite, but if it's going to have the same effect on the human protein, that could be, that, that, that could be a, a cause for concern. And we can now see what the difference between the way this molecule binds to the Leishmania protein and the equivalent in the human system is, and that will allow us to design the molecules to be selective for just the parasite without having a negative impact on the human host. So I guess you just mentioned a little bit of the impact this partnership is already having. Uh, but give us a sense of after and before, you know, we've probably been working in neglected diseases for a while. Now with the collaboration of DeepMind, how much do you think that's going to accelerate the, the, the drug discovery process? It can, so it can, it can certainly help accelerate the drug discovery process. I mean, we've been working, we being the drug design community, um, we benefit enormously from having structures and knowing how the molecules bind to those structures. And, you know, there were a limited number of proteins that you could apply that level of technology to because you had to be able to get them to crystallize and you had to be able to get them uh, to yield to x-ray crystallography or other structural interpretations. There are, I mean, great scientists that work in that space, but it was limited. Now that we have the ability to predict the structures with a level of confidence, uh, as John mentioned, very high level of confidence, that can really enable and broaden the scope of drug discovery projects that can use or exploit these technologies. So it's, it's broadening and also helping then accelerate. Um, there are also a couple of other really interesting potential uses of this. Uh, so, for example, if we think about um, you know the coronavirus situation, right? Uh, there's a lot of talk at the moment thinking about how we better prepare for the next pandemic, whenever that appears. And one of the things we can do is we can look at all of the different viruses that are out there and look at the way that those protein structures, which are now can be predicted by AlphaFold, how they may vary across variations of parasite. You know, there are 20 or 30 different known coronaviruses out there that are similar to SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 uh, causative parasite. If you can look at all similar proteins and look at the, protein, at, at the proteins and the points on the proteins where the structures are the same, where they don't vary too much, you know that that's going to be a good drug target. It's going to be a good drug target for a coronaviruses that haven't appeared yet, because when they and when they do appear, you can design a drug that you can take off the shelf and just say, we've got a pretty good bet that that's going to be something we can use for a future viral uh, pandemic. And tell me now a little bit more about how, how do you think this partnership can democratize or help democratize the process of drug discovery? Yeah, so that, that's another really great part of, of this 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 whole project so a lot of the diseases that we work in at, at dndi as i mentioned the neglected tropical diseases there are academics working all over the world on this on, on, on thinking about these but a lot of those academic researchers tend to be based understandably in the regions where those diseases are endemic so most of the world's experts in trypanosoma cruzi which is the cause of agent of chagas disease are based in latin america because that's where the disease appears um, there's some really great scientists there, but if we're talking about the ability to do structure-based drug discovery or to understand protein structure, up until recently, up until you know, the AlphaFold uh, situation, it was uh, a, a lot of that work was contingent on having access to infrastructure that just may not exist or may not be accessible. To do X-ray crystallography at a decent rate, you need to access to a synchrotron. You need access to a high pro you know, to a high field NMR machine. There are only a handful of these in the UK, for example. So. By, make, by, by uh, enabling structure-based biology, structure-based discovery, structure-based you know, um, analysis of proteins at the computational level, you now all you need is access to the, to the internet, basically, and, and you know, access, access to maybe a little bit of cloud computing or access to uh, a, a, decent, um, a decent computer. And that is much more readily available in the areas where a lot of these endemic researchers are. So this is, again, a really interesting part of the, of the whole AlphaFold 2 universe is that it enables this work to be done by pretty much anyone anywhere, whereas that was not necessarily the case previously for some of the more experimental techniques. Of course. John, uh, your partnership with Ben's organization and it, or institute rather is, is a great example of, I guess, the early impact that AlphaFold is having on, in the community. Can you mention other examples of projects you're running at the moment with, with other organizations? I mean, I think more, I think we've got this really great partnership that we've run. And one of the really interesting things, and I should say one of the really exciting things is to see the early impact that uh, BINS Group um, 
has had one of the really exciting things now and really helped us understand the applications of AlphaFold. One of the really exciting things now is that AlphaFold is open source and the database is available. And so one of the great things is that we're able to have this impact even, even more decentralized and it doesn't depend on us going away and doing something now. You know, you can type AlphaFold into your browser and you can get a protein structure if you'd like one. Um, but I think in terms of what I've been really excited about seeing in the research community and the early response to the database, which has been incredible, and just some of the remarks about, you know, never has so quickly a tool become universal among structural biologists and students, you know, using it immediately. Ones that I've been really excited about, I think one has been like determining a protein structure. There's, a, there's an aspect which AlphaFold gives back. It's determining a protein structure has two parts. One is incredibly difficult, and the second one is also incredibly difficult. And the first incredibly difficult part is uh, to make these crystals and get experimental data and go to this big uh, national synchrotron facility and get this. And then when you get that, you don't know the structure yet. You have to do the second phase. And if you don't know a pretty good guess of the answer or use some other techniques that are more difficult, you may not ever get your answer. And so we've had lots of researchers that have a quite literally decade, 10 year old data that someone collected that they really wanted to know the answer and they shut down this research project because they were never able to go from their experimental data to a picture of the protein. And then they got the alpha fold prediction and it was so close that it solved it immediately. And so I've, I can't tell you how many emails we've said, I had 10 year old data that we had given all up all hope on and 30 minutes later I knew I found the answer and was able to pull the answer out. And that's incredibly gratifying that we're able to give back. I think also, some of the research that's been done on COVID that has started to use these early predictions we made of uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins, NSP2, have been really exciting joint um, experiment and prediction. Um, and finally, I guess the partnership that we've uh, done with the Center for Enzyme Innovation, working on, develop on finding plastic eating enzymes and how to understand that. And really um, some incredible work out of that team and then this wonderful symbiosis with AlphaFold, where they have these candidates and, you know, finding the structure of them would take a very long time. And it's one thing if you know you want the structure, right? This is a central protein in some ca human cancer. Yes, we want that. People are going to spend the time on it. But this enzyme may or may not be promising. And I, I'm really excited by the cases in which people look at an AlphaFold structure and go, oh, goodness, that wasn't what I hoped for. And they stopped doing that. And that represents a year of this incredible researcher's time that is not spent on that, that's spent on something really useful. And I mean, similarly, we're actually seeing a lot of cases and researchers take a very serious look at, you know, about 30% of the human proteome, the, the parts of the human proteins are disordered, have no fixed structure. There's nothing for AlphaFold to say, really. Um, and people have found that AlphaFold not being confident in a prediction is the best predictor we have of this protein being unstructured completely. And so I'm really, really excited about the ways in which we're seeing all these different uses and all these creative uses of AlphaFold that have been enabled. And I think really where it points is very, very exciting. Those are fascinating, fascinating examples. Uh, would, one of our earlier speakers was Kai Fu Lee, and he was talking about his book, AI in 2041. So looking forward, what can we expect uh, in terms of AlphaFold in beating complex diseases like cancer and dementia? I think it's a really great question and I'll, I'll answer it two ways. And I like to say AlphaFold is kind of two things when we look back on it. One is a software program that you can download or use in the cloud that if you have a protein sequence will give you a very good guess at its protein structure. And this has an enormous impact, but I think it's also something else in the sense that it's, as you say, one of the one of the landmark problems in biology is can we can we predict this at all? Can we understand proteins computationally? And AlphaFold giving a positive answer to this, and the ideas within AlphaFold are going to be applicable to so many more problems in protein biology and probably wider evolutionary biology. And so, what I think we'll we hopefully will see is that this will be one of the starting guns of the era in which AI has an enormous amount to say about understanding the cell and understanding biology. And when, you know, we really say that diseases like cancer and dementia, and for example, Alzheimer's are extremely hard to treat, we don't understand them very well. 
and we don't understand all the processes going on and we don't necessarily know, as Ben says, drug design has a target and we don't know what to target um, in order to make people healthy with dementia. And I, so I think really what we will see in the, in the kind of 2041 is that these tools will meet the complexity of biology and we'll start to understand the cell better and that will pull these diseases from extremely difficult and extremely kind of experimental and kind of interventional and hoping and will bring us to a much better understanding of cellular biology and that this will lead to a very, very different relationship to how we do drug development and cure disease and, and everything else. Although I should also, you know, let, let Ben, who's much more an expert on drug design than I am, weigh in. Go ahead, Ben. No, I'm, I agree with everything that John just said. I think that if we're thinking 20 years in the future, this idea that, that by, you know, science is small steps, right? It's, you, have, you have to build step upon step upon step. This is, a, this is a big step forward to be able to predict the structures. The next thing is, okay, well, how does that help us understand how a cell works and how a cell actually is, is constantly evolving? And in, my, in, in our cases, how a parasite, for example, might interact with the cell and understand how, they, how the infection takes place, same thing from a virology perspective. Understanding the better understanding we have of those mechanisms, the more likely it is that we can find the right target or combination of targets to be able to treat diseases that have so far eluded us. Great. Um, ben and John, thank you so much for your time. It was fascinating talking to you. And uh, good luck with the rest of the work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure.